Hello there. I'm so excited to talk to you about this topic today. We're going to talk proprioception and self-agency. That is that feeling that you have control or you're responsible for your movements. This is such an interesting topic for so many neurologic disorders and many other conditions, to be honest. Um, so we're going to dive in. My name is Julie Hirschberg. I am a neurologic physical therapist. I am the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness. We're in the Los Angeles area. And I love the questions that you bring me and um, the things that we're doing at Reactive. It constantly has me asking questions. And one of those questions really has been in relation to the sensory system and how it impacts impacts uh, what is happening in our bodies. And I hear from so many of our clients that uh, they can't sense where their body is in space or they don't feel like they have control over their movements and they have a real strong loss of autonomy um, and, and sense of control. And that is called self-agency. And in functional neurologic disorders particularly, but this is also showing up in other disorders like post-concussion, uh, CRPS, um, some forms of dizziness, um, in dystonia, um, and actually in stroke and brain injury, that people experience a loss of self-agency, a loss of ability to um, feel in control of their movement. It makes sense in many neurologic disorders. Um, I know what the other disorders I was going to say was hypermobility. Um, many folks with hypermobility, such as uh, EDS, may also experience uh, lack of proprioception and feedback and therefore less control of their movements, uh, which are exhausting and lead to fatigue and a lack of self-agency. So uh, last week, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole in the literature and I wanted to share a couple of pieces with you. So I've got two articles to share and then I want to talk about the implications. So I'm going to bring the names of the articles to you here. The first one was actually the one that caught my attention last week. The first author, let me pull up the name, uh, Paul Morosco is the first author um, from the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Awesome. Way to go. Um, and this is in an annual review of physiology. The name of the article is Proprioception, a new era set in motion by emerging genetic and bionic strategies. Actually, it's a question mark, a new era. Um, so it's a review article, which is always so nice to dive into because it goes into the anatomy and tons of research in this area. And it's an area, honestly, I'm not really familiar with. So a lot of the research when it comes to better understanding proprioception and its role in our movement and control comes from prosthetics um, because they're really, um, I don't know if you all, I, I, I used to work in the field of amputees, um, actually loved it. And um, the it has progressed so much since I was a, a young new grad and there is so much happening in these uh, bionic limbs and neural interfaces. So what's kind of cool is that the research in looking at how can we better set up uh, prosthetic limbs so that a person may feel ownership of it. That research is actually really helping inform the rest of us about proprioception and how it works um, in everybody else's life. So um, thank you, amazing researchers, particularly biomedical engineers who are doing these kinds of studies because it's helping the rest of us. So particularly what they did in this review article was look at the mechanisms of proprioception. So by the way, I'm not sure if I defined it. Proprioception is that ability that we have um, to feel where we are in space. Uh, meaning I can tell now that I'm extending my finger or I'm flexing my finger. I get that sensation from a few different ways. Um, 
So I get it through stretch of my skin. I also get it through receptors that are in the joints uh, that are telling me where that joint is moving. Uh, those are two of the ways that it can occur. Um, another part of our sensory system is also telling where we are in relation to other things in our environment. So proprioception is really where we are in our body. Um, but our, our, our brain and our nervous system integrates a lot of information to actually give us this feedback. And this review article was like a neuro nerd dream. So if you love neuroanatomy, if you love neurophysiology, I would definitely dive in. It's got all these great diagrams of all the different receptors in our muscles, in our joints, uh, along our skin. And um, it's fabulous. It talks about all the pathways of how this information is carried from the peripheral level of the receptor through the body, through the spinal cord, the reflexes, and how it's integrated uh, both in the brainstem and the brain uh, and the cerebellum. Um, so really great article from that standpoint. And um, I wanted to highlight a couple of pieces of the article. And again, um, this is a free full text article. So I always include a link in our newsletter every week. So if you're a clinician, get on our newsletter at reactiveeducation.com. If you are a therapist, get on our, or I'm sorry, if you're a patient, get on our newsletter at reactivept.com. I'll send it out. I'll send out this video and I'll send out links to these articles that I'm talking about. So one of the pieces that initially caught my attention in here was as they talked about multisensory integration and how this leads to our sense in our body that, that we embody our body, that we are connected to it, and that we know that we can cause a movement. And um, I don't know about you, but as a clinician, I hear from people all of the time, I don't feel connected to my body. I can't feel my legs. I can't feel my arm. Um, I feel floaty, like I'm, I'm disconnected and watching, but not really embodied in my body. A person might not say embodied, but they feel disconnected and they don't feel that they have control of movement. And so when I read through this, um, I was like, oh my gosh, that just makes sense. So I actually want to read a portion of this paper where they talk about multisensory integration and they talk about it as functional neural, neural organization. So when we're talking about functional neurologic disorders and many other of these disorders that are due to changes in connection in the brain, some of this stuff is just literally being discovered through some of this advanced research. So they talked about multisensory integration of touch, hearing, vision, proprioception, and how these all converge on networks in the brain, particularly in the parietal lobe, lobe but also multiple areas in the brain. I'm going to grab my brain as we're talking about this. I mean, not my brain, um, but this brain. <laughs> um, but parietal lobe is where um, our primary sensation of touch comes in and our proprioception um, is organized. And this secondary somatosensory cortex in the posterior parietal lobe is where a lot of integration takes place. But also integration takes place in multiple lobes of the brain. And this integration, so this is where I want to read this, this multisensory integration system um, functions as a comparator. So it's constantly comparing, continuously monitoring to correct for errors between an individual's internal model of predicted reality. This is what our brain does, it creates an internal model to predict what uh, what our reality is. I know this sounds very like matrix, but I, I promise this is what the science says. This is what our brain does. So multi-sensory integration system comparing. So constantly monitoring, correcting for errors between the person's internal model and what actually is happening. 
And what actually is happening is what it is attained through our sensory systems. And it's kinesthesia, which is a type of proprioception. Kinesthesia appears to play a central role in mediating the interaction between the intent of a movement and the outcome that is necessary for establishing a framework of self reference. So if you're going to embody yourself and have a self reference for what's going to occur in your movement, um, proprioception and kinesthesia is integral. The other thing that they said here, um, and this, com this com network of comparison is important for body ownership. So I know, okay, so Ethnicity Gardens is saying absolutely fascinating. Isn't this fascinating? It literally like, I feel like poof blows my mind. This brain should just be blowing up. It also makes sense. And I kind of go like, oh, wow, why didn't I think of this before? But I just hadn't thought of this before. So it blows my mind that a person may feel disembodied, disassociated, and often we think of those things um, as sometimes they're like a protective mechanism. We disassociate after a physical injury or trauma because it's painful. Um, but we may also experience that because of an impaired kinesthetic sense or proprioception. And we know there are many disorders where a person may have impaired kinesthesia or proprioception. So hypermobility or EDS is one of those. Um, autism is one of those. And actually, when I was reading all this brain science, it made me think of some of the brain science of some of the connectivity differences in, a, in an autistic brain. So fascinating. So one other piece that I... Um, wanted to talk about because it relates to um, the other study I want to hit on, um, the kinesthetic movement sense, so which is part of our proprioception, um, seems to be one of the most important. And uh, one of the ways that they have studied this is they will actually vibrate muscle tendons. And when they do this, it gives a person, so again, this is in research studies, it generates an uh, illusion of limb movement for a person, even without the movement occurring. So you could vibrate a muscle tendon and you could give the illusion to the person that their limb is moving even when it's not moving. Now you can imagine this is really, really helpful. And again, this research is coming from prosthetic limb. They, when, when you have a prosthetic limb, you would love to feel ownership of it. You would love to get feedback about what's occurring without some of the peripheral receptors. So they're looking at how can we do this? What are the mechanisms for this? And um, vibration of muscle tendons is one. And so um, they they go through some really interesting studies and again a super long paper so i'm not i'm not going to go through all of it um but i did want to read one more part and i see a couple questions coming in so i'm going to get to those as well so one part of the paper was called multi-sensory integration and the sense of agency um so let's go back to our brain they say considering that this posterior parietal cortex cortex, the secondary somatosensory area, is this confluence point for complex, multisensory, and motor information. It has been proposed that this area may also be involved in perceptual mapping of the body in relation to the environment. Multisensory integration and intention to move, action, outcome, are all a big part of self-agency. Um, that, that person's ability to feel in control of their actions. And the system, this is what they say, um, the system, 
I want to read. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the anterior insula. So the insula, actually, I can kind of show you this here. Uh, if you peeled open um, between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe, that's your insular cortex. Um, the insula is what is activated with these uh, vibrations to muscle tendons that give the illusion of, of movement. Um, and it seems to be that the insula is a big part of what allows us to feel like we are controlling a movement. So when we talk about disorders of connectivity, we're not talking necessarily that there is a lesion in the insula, but that there is incorrect or inaccurate connections between these areas. And what we know and understand in a lot of disorders is that the um, also the sensory feedback might be impaired. So I hope this is starting to give you loads of ideas of that we first need to test this, both proprioception and kinesthetic sense. And this should be a, an important part of rehabilitation for many disorders, but particularly when that person feels disconnected. So um, I'm going to pause here. I have one more study to share, but I want to make sure I answer questions. So let me get in here. Um, somebody asked, why does my brain twitch in the right hemisphere frontal lobe? Um, well, that's a very good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I'm curious what you mean of brain twitching. Um, we, I will tell you the primary sensations that we might perceive from anything in the brain are usually from the external surface or the dura in the brain. So the dura is the covering of the brain and it's highly innervated. Um, so when somebody might be feeling particular movements or sensations around their brain, I think the first thing I'm wondering is, is if the person actually has some sort of migraine um, because migraines, um, the pathophysiology of them actually is from some of the uh, peripheral nerves, primarily, uh, primarily, I tried to say primarily and trigeminal in the same word, but the trigeminal nerve, um, but some of the other peripheral cranial nerves um, as well, getting sensitized. Um, I guess that's what I would wonder, but that that that's a very interesting question. Um, somebody else said, good stuff. Great. Somebody else said, neuro chiropractor told me he thought my proprioception issues with my eyes could be causing eye tremors or head tremors. I'm sorry. That's a great insight. Uh, absolutely. So um, you have proprioception throughout your body. Um, a huge area of proprioception is from the neck. And when that is impaired, oh boy, can a person feel um, not only pain or experience tremor or dystonia, um, but dizziness. So um, yeah, really great insight. Somebody else is saying phantom limb. Yeah, so um, again, a lot of this research has come from that, um, that world. Somebody else says, please save this live session. I will indeed. So every time I do a live session, I save the video, I send it out in the newsletter, but it'll always be on our Instagram profile as well. Um, Somebody is saying, you know more and are willing to know more than an actual neurologist. Well, I don't know about that. The willing, yes, indeed. Am I curious? Yes, indeed. Am I going to read all of these crazy articles? I will, um, because that's just what I love to do. Not sure I know more than a neurologist. Um, and I'm not a neurologist. I'm a neuro-PD that's insanely curious. I will take that from you and thank you um, for that. And I know many folks that are here in our community are also insanely curious. And that's why you're here. And that's why I love you. So thank you. Um, okay, I want to share one more article. So interesting. 
this one is more thinking about those concepts of how we might actually change a person's self-agency with this knowledge of improving proprioception. So um, what? let me give you the title of the article, Proprioceptive Stimulation Added to a Walking Self-Avatar Enhances the Illusory Perception of Walking in Static Participants. First author is lab, I'm going to say L-A-B-B-E, maybe I misread that. Um, the authors are from Montreal, Canada, and this article is in Frontiers in Virtual Reality. Now, I also have had this interest in virtual reality and gaming as a potential mechanism. I don't do this a lot, but I'm very interested in it because of this potential to embody a body that is not our own in the virtual reality. So that's what they looked at here. So when, um, so first thing is, is what is this um, walking self avatar and so on. So they were looking at an immersed virtual, virtual reality. So the user views their body, um, and the body reflects the movements. I don't know why I'm doing this, but the body moves with the person. So um, if you have ever played a video game like this, like Oculus, you have sensors and um, the, the your avatar moves like you. So um, what they were looking at is could, can they, um, increase a person's sense of self-agency in this avatar, especially if a person can't walk or move, but they want the avatar to walk and move. So they did this through muscle vibrations, which I talked about in the last article. Muscle vibrations and tendon vibrations can actually, because they then go on to stimulate some of these um, uh, multi-sensory inputs in the brain, they can give the illusion that you're moving while you're not moving. So they did lower limb muscle vibrations with gait-like patterns, so like they were walking, and they, they then asked participants if they felt more embodied. So turns out there's an embodiment questionnaire. Who knew? I did not know that. Um, so they had 30 participants um, and they had the, a walking avatar from a first person perspective and they compared it either with the muscle vibrations or um, without. Um, and actually they did several different uh, conditions for, for the vibration. Um, what they found is that they, the person who had vibrations to their lower limb that most stimulated walking actually had some, so they weren't walking. So the person in the virtual reality watching their avatar, the avatar's walking, but the person's not walking, but they're vibrating muscle tendons to give this illusion of walking that person actually had more sway as they were standing that was similar to the avatar walking and the person felt more embodied they improved their sense of self-agency this blew my mind again um be one because I, I love using vibration it's one of my favorite sensory tools I never thought of it as almost sending signals to the brain like a person's moving. That part I had never thought of, and now I'm just like, I want to try this. And as Ethnicity Garden says, that makes perfect sense. It, it makes sense. Now I want to do it more, though. I want to bring this into more treatment, particularly for a person that maybe has a full body paralysis or really 
uh, struggles to generate automatic movements with their limb. I also really love the idea of doing this in a virtual reality world. Now, again, this was in a treatment uh, study. It was from 2021. Um, and I actually, I was thinking about James Finley. He is a phenomenal researcher at USC who does a lot of virtual reality and neurologic disorders. Um, I was going to send him this article and say, oh my gosh, what are people doing for treatment with this? Are they studying this? I, I still have more rabbit holes to go down is what I'm telling you and I haven't gone down them yet. Um, but it made me think a lot about how we might better use vibration particularly, um, vibration in particular patterns to simulate walking, and what changes that might have on the brain, particularly um, to kind of prime and prep the brain for movement and a person that might not be able to move. Or would this, so would vibration, so I'm thinking about even my mobile folks that are walking, but it is very fatiguing and energy consuming or requires a lot of concentration. Could we actually use vibration to help augment some of the sensory feedback and improve some automaticity to movement so that the person can restore some automatic movement with less of the energy expenditure? That was another question I had. Again, hasn't been studied, but these are my curious questions about trying this. What I do know is we do use vibration. We do use it as a sensory modality and sensory training. And now I think this makes me think, ah, oh, we could even be more specific in this. And we could use this with virtual reality. I think it would be really interesting. So more to come, I will tell you. Um, Ethnicity Gardens is saying this reminds me of visualization, but a more powerful, powerful version. So I was thinking the same thing. So virtual reality is actually a lot of visualization. And I love that you can kind of, you can embody a body in virtual reality, but, but let's do that visualization with some sensory input that mimics what you're doing. Doesn't that sound great? So Ethnicity Gardens, I think it's a great idea. I think we should, uh, we should do it and try it out um, for, for treatment. Um, but I, I, I think this is an opportunity, particularly in disorders where we see a lack of self-agency, meaning that person um, feels dissociated, disembodied, floaty, um, not connected to their limbs. Using proprioceptive input, kinesthetic input, vibration um, as, as treatment could be really beneficial. And, um, and I know it's something that we do a lot um, at Reactive, but I want to try some new ways. And I want to encourage clinicians, because I got to tell you, I did not learn any sensory training in school. I don't even teach it in school. This is all stuff after school. <laughs> so, um, so assessing the sensory system, training the sensory system, so very important. And especially for the person who lacks self-agency. So you, you, you got to do it. Um, and in fact, if you're a clinician, we uh, created a guide for you of sensory assessments. And it actually includes the kinesthetic uh, sense test. So this kind of beyond our basic sensory test of like, do you have impaired sensation? But going deeper to really test some of that multi-sensory integration of the posterior parietal, parietal lobe or somatosensory secondary cortex back here. Um, so it goes through a how to test two point discrimination, nine grid localization, kinesthesia, um, and it takes you through step by step because I will always say you're, you're not going to just go in and throw vibration on people. You want to test 
and see if there is impairment and then go into treatment so that, that you can test again and see if it improves too. So um, you're only as good as your assessment. So download that guide. You can get it at reactiveeducation.com slash sensory. Um, if, if you're a clinician, this guide is for you. If you're not a clinician, you can download it and give it to your therapist. It'd be super helpful um, and say, hey, I want you to test these things on me. Um, and um, again, I'll send out the articles from today and this video as I do every week in our newsletter. Um, so if you're a clinician, you can join at reactiveeducation.com. If you are a patient, join at reactivept.com and I will send those out. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me, for your curiosity like mine about the brain and um, keep the questions coming and I will keep going down rabbit holes and sharing all that I find. Uh, thank you so much and I will see you again soon.